Okay, <clears throat> so we can get started. Um, so the first thing I have is um, most of the open questions for um, the unit test PR that checks the round tripping of um, APIs have been um, have been answered and uh, they have been completed. So as of now, make test includes this invocation of this unit test and um, it will check for uh, round tripping of um, API objects. So I encourage uh, people, Ed and Lubo, um, I think we should jump on it and um, start getting reviews. So this can merge um, before this code freeze of this release. Perfect. I think we still have a week or two. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll CC you. Um, I just found out that uh, one of the uh, CI test is failing, but once it is ready, I'll CC you guys onto it. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, um, Ed, so another discussion topic I have for today is this um, community proposal that was merged. We had this on, on our list of design documents to go through. Um, this was the first one in from the priority list the last time. Um, I went through the design document. I had some questions um, in in a generic direction kind of question. So um, let me, b before I start asking those questions, um, do you want to set a context for this or we can go dig in immediately? Um, do you need a context or? Not me. Uh, oh, not oh, so in general, I, I can say a few words if you want. It's, yeah. uh... It, there, there, there is a, there was a need, or there is a need, uh, for IPs assigned by IPAM on secondary networks to be persisted through the while the VM is defined, not only running but defined. So, if, for example, you have a VM, you start it, it gets a, an IP address on the second uh, secondary network, then it stopped and then it started again. You want uh, to get the same IP address on that secondary network slash interface. So this is this is the core of this uh, proposal. Uh, it, this is usually for uh, the sen the main scenario is is that, for example, um, someone has a VM even with a single interface. But he doesn't want to to use the pod network, so what he will usually do is define the, an interface for with a multus uh, network, which is the secondary network, and and he will get an IP on that interface, and he wants to keep that IP for the while the VM is defined, like it's linked to the VM object or VM resource on the API server. So, yeah, so and, is, the, and the, yeah. the problem is that when, so underneath the hoods, VM uses VMI and pod, right? And the IPs go away when the VM is stopped, right? That That's something you wanted to solve. Yes, that, so the, because we have the differentiation between VM, VMI, and pods, uh, a VM can, I mean, VMIs and pods are like, they're, they live, together more or less so the the ip is persistent why the pod why the vm is running and you have a vmi in the pod but one once you do a stop as this ip goes away and goes back to the to the pool and then when you start it again even if it's the same vm you most likely will get a different ip from that pool but yeah. because it's the same vm and the and you still want the same persisted IP, and you still want the same IP to get. 
for your VM to come up with. So yes, usually yeah. I pump today is per pod or which means per VMI, but we want it to be per VM. Yeah, makes sense. So yeah, I had some generic questions here. So when when we use this secondary IP addresses, um, secondary networks, uh, does that allow us to integrate with Kubernetes networking like um, the service object or um, endpoints, like how pods are integrated? Mm, interesting. So, so this proposal, uh, it is kind of generic, but it's also not generic exactly. So the generic nature of it is that it depends on some uh, some other proposal that this is like the only the proposal for the integration in Covert, but the original proposal talks about having a, an object, a resource, custom resource that is uh, named IP claim. So you create an IP claim and that IP claim gets an IP. And while this IP claim is, is in the API server, that IP is reserved. So everything else is using that. Now, this you need two, two parties here. One is the client, which in our case is covert. Like I'm creating a VM, so I want an IP claim. And then I assign this IP claim to that uh, to my interface, for example. But the, there is also the provider that makes sure that this, that knows to interpret this IP claim. And that's in this case, the only provider that I know that knows how to handle it is currently OVN Kubernetes. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in this sense, OVN Kubernetes does support secondary networks and it does uh, allow you, I think, to have, or it, it is supposed to go in the direction to have uh, services and all kinds of stuff, other added value to support it. But yeah. But I'm not sure if it exists today. Whatever the, that provider gives you, that network provider gives you, this is what you will get. So it's yeah, not yeah. really related to the, the... So to the... the whole orchestration makes sense to me. Um, and the only thing I'm wondering is, is this completely detached from Kubernetes networking or somehow there are integration points to the Kubernetes networking where we can surface this secondary network information into services and uh, endpoint objects. Um, that that's that's where I was going with this. I I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure what. I mean, you mean who will use it? I mean, I don't think it's it's really connected strongly to Kubernetes in the sense that it has anything to do with the classic networking in Kubernetes. Classic networking Kubernetes is only primary network. I see. Right? Uh, Multus and uh, stuff like that, they are like add-ons. Got it. Okay, makes sense. So yeah, that was, so I, I think my next question is an extension of this is, so if we look at applications that run in VM, right? So there, there are two approaches in, in general that I see. The classic Kubernetes approach where they say that application pods are ephemeral. So you need your applications to be uh, discoverable. Uh, so in other words, they will not have sticky IP addresses. They will discover the new IP address when one instance of the pod uh, comes up through that service object. And then uh, the application will get, will self discover the IP address of the new instance and continue from there on, right? So my, my question is, why is there a need for both the self discoverable part and the sticky part? And, and what are kind of the use cases where the, self-discoverable applications will not work and we will need this uh, sticky IP address um, solution. I think this is a, this this is like what you said about self-discovery and stuff like that. That's like the 
Kubernetes thing, then how they they look at pods as something that if it doesn't work or is a problem, it will just be killed and, and something new will start. Like it's uh, uh, it's expensive, right? Expendable, sorry. But VMs is not like that. VMs like it, it has state. So even if you shut it down and you start it again, uh, and the application there may be st sticky and it has a, maybe some uh, expectation either from management point of view or other other perspective that is not using these services and so on. It's like, as I see it, it's like legacy uh, virtual machines that were uh, that are moving from the old infrastructure, the old virtualization processor, or move into the the Kubernetes or Kubert infrastructure. And it's still not part of the the whole uh, orchestration of uh, of how Kubernetes uh, looks at things. So in this sense, no, I I think um, that makes sense. That's... But what what I'm wondering is that it, it seems like strategically, Kubert's position is that we will be kind of in the middle where we'll help um, application transition from legacy. Um, providers to this new cloud native way of doing things, right? And from, from that strategic point of view, my line of thinking is what would it take for applications in the VM to be discoverable, right? Can Kubert provide a way for application owners to take this small problem domain of self-discovering uh, network information and modify their applications like that. Uh, if if they can, and if Kubert successfully provides that, that will be one stepping stone towards transitioning uh, into this cloud native um, journey, right? So in in that sense, my my thoughts are that we should explore the question what will it take to bring the applications in self-discoverable mode, uh, which is slightly tangential to this proposal. But yeah, uh, th that was my summary of digging into this proposal. Okay. But yes, I think you summarized it well. It's like uh, the it, it comes to serve application that are not using uh, that are they're expected in the past the static IP and they are continue to expect it. It's an application or or management system that manages VMs, uh, like partial things in the VM. So I'm not sure if they, this is what they expect and this is what they want. They want to have every time the VM comes up, they want to know that the the IP is uh, is sticky there. It's it. I actually, it's it makes sense in 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 the world of uh, servers, physical servers. That was like the a pretty standard that that machines will have a, a fixed uh, IP address. They didn't use dynamic IP address allocation, and things didn't change all the time. It was pretty stable. But and and that that physical machines move to virtual machines and now they are trying to move virtual machines into pod so yeah this 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 need came from the probably from the from the older older versions yeah makes sense <clears throat> the other things i wanted to ask um is that the approach that the solution has taken is um create a new cr that will have a different life cycle than um, the pod and and the VMI, right? Um, are there cases where there will be a leak in in that CR? So, for example, um, VMIs are are deleted. Sorry, VMs are stop. VMs are deleted, and those CRs persist in the cluster, reserving the um, IP addresses that is not used by anyone. Uh, 
is that a valid concern or is that handled by the design i, I was not sure can you can you just repeat i'm sorry like what what can be the situation that what so happened? let's say if uh, so the life cycle of uh, the ip claim object is different from that of a pod and vmi right so if a vm is so let's say you create a thousand vms and you create thousand ip claims for those vms now you delete 500 but can there be cases where the number of ipms will stay at 1000 and not be deleted so that will lead to a leak of ip addresses in the system yeah i think i think the solution that was proposed here is that the ip claim is uh is is own is owned by the vm object so if the vm object is deleted eventually the garbage collection will take out the ip claim Okay. That's the current solution that they, that was proposed. Okay. But Perfect. even if that was not the case, let's say it, you had uh, something else, then yes, someone needs to take them out. Like if they don't have any owner, then they need to get to be removed. Okay. Yeah. I think and that was, uh, that they did, I think they did say, explain it, this is how it works. The, the only the only thing here that I was like not happy about was that uh, it was it was added to co it is I mean it's still not added but uh, it's like almost there that it is added to covert core project and it's not done uh, externally like it is a lot all of the logic and everything is added to covert covert that one I didn't like so much but. Uh, I was in the minority here. So for now, I'm not, uh, we will see what will happen. Okay. My understanding was that you need this logic in Cubeboard because it is feature gated. Is that? It okay. is feature gated. No, but I, yeah, it is feature gated. So that's not, but you know, not, this is not why you need the, no, the the logic the logic currently says that it's up to the virt controller when it creates the VMI or when it creates the when it processes the VM doesn't matter how exactly it is done. It also creates the the IP claim. Like it is it is its responsibility to do it up to the virt controller. So it's all the logic is inside covert covert in the virt controller. Uh, that part I yeah. didn't like so much, but uh, and the, the the other alternative was that uh, the virt, the virt, I mean, covert will only mark that it wants it or something like that, like a feature gate. It doesn't matter how that he he wants to have an IP claim, and uh, and and the the orchestration is done by some other controller outside a controller or webhook doesn't matter not part of covid that was the alternative yeah it's like a yeah from outside that's it so other thoughts that i had reading this proposal is that um this claim like asking for a claim and getting a resource from for that claim sounds like API wise, problem domain wise, sounds very similar to uh, DRA. Um, I wonder if we can use the DRA APIs to assign IP addresses uh, and and not uh, like devices. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know that one. It's like uh, DRA is. Uh, I didn't study it deeply but uh yeah so I don't, I, I don't know how to answer that one dra usually it's for devices not for not for uh, ip addresses so maybe it can be yeah. somehow uh, converted to it but i don't know i can give you like a two two minute summary of this dra right so the way it works is you you're familiar with uh persistent volume claims and persistent volumes api right so the claim is yeah. that you request uh, 
a st piece of storage and then it gets bounded to a PV and that satisfies the claim. The DRA APIs are very similar to that. Um, so you would have a resource claim and that will be something that you are claiming in the system. And then the system, the controllers in the background work to satisfy that claim, right? Now, currently I agree it's just with devices. However, the problem that you have that you want the life cycle of this IP address to be different from that of a pod, and then you want to request a claim and some other actors, which is the network provisioner or something, will satisfy that claim for you. The building blocks exist in that API for us to reuse. So yeah, I I think it might be a worthy exercise to try it and, and see if that works. Yeah, you can, uh, you can, it's for, first of all, if, when it will get in, if, if it will get in cover, cover or from outside, doesn't matter, it still will be in some alpha state. So it can be challenged even after, I think. Uh, oh, so this, this solution. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. The solution here is, is going to get in one way or the other, even if, if it's in cover, covered or from outside, it will still get in and integrated and it will be considered in evaluation stage. So in that period, if there, if you, if someone will have other solution to this, then it can be erased. I don't know if they, I don't know if they consider the array this, in this context. Okay. I it's funny like I'm here the area all over the place now it's like a very common topic <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it sounds like uh, what device plugin was before now the now we have something new and it solves everything <laughs> yeah or not <laughs> we will know <laughs> I I think like it it does solve a lot of problems so um yeah, I'm actually looking forward to it um, anyway, I, I think, yeah, that's all the questions I have. I did not get a chance to take a look at that PR, uh, but from a design perspective, the APIs are in, in a separate repository. And yeah, I, I think whatever changes are in Kubeboard, um, they are going to be in alpha. So I, I think all of this makes sense. Okay, uh, the third topic I had is the SIG API Charter. We have been discussing on creating a PR about this since quite a while. And I have some good news, the PR is up. It's currently in draft. Uh, I was not sure if there are other places where I need to change things. So um, encourage folks to take a look. Um, this is again, all of the things that we have discussed on the call. So nothing should be surprising here. Okay, looks nice, thank you. I will, uh, we need to prioritize this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so with that, uh, one quick question follow up from last time, um, Ed, were you able to uh, get access to the uh, project board? Oh, one, one sec. So first of all, I think I didn't get uh, an invitation from what I remember, but uh, one second, let me. Let's see. Mm. Wait, I missed the, what is the link? Oh, API review board, this one? Uh, the, no, uh, not one. Yeah, this one, one, one second. 
Uh, my computer is glitchy. Um, how do I know if I have access? I, know, uh, I don't have access because I cannot do an add or something. I think. Uh, that is. Do you at least see the board? Yes. No, board, I always saw it, but I was not able to. One second. I'm trying to understand if I have a way to add, for example, some item here. I know I, although I can add a new column to the board. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so the second. way you add it is here, like on the bottom. Oh, one sec. Ah, yes, yes. So then, then, yes, then it's fine. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because on the access portal, I do see your name as an admin role. So. Okay, okay. Yes, I see now. It's fine. It was not like that. Yes, before I did, could not have this uh, last. That's, that's like... Looks fine now. Okay, all right, perfect. All right, so if you can help out with um, putting things on this, uh, I, I think you mentioned last time that there are a lot of things you wanted to get added uh, on the to-dos side of things. So um, yes. please add stuff there. Yeah, I'll start using it now, thanks. All right, so with that, let me quickly open the PRs in flight. I think we need to jump on this one. Uh, this one already merged. There was a Functional test added. I think that's uh, the only, the main thing here was just bumping the version. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the other one is the same as well. Uh, even this one. Uh, is this version bumping a manual process or is this automated? Does anyone know? I don't know, but it's interesting here that uh, for anything under vendoring that I guess there is no, we have no control. I don't, I don't see the need to review that one, but just it's interesting that if they bumped here the a CRD, right? Is it a CRD or? Yeah, it's a CRD. And and what I will, I mean, what maybe is important here. And so first of all, we don't have a real a procedure of how to bump things like this at all. Maybe that's something that needs to be written. But what I will, um, what will be interesting here is to see if, if they just replace the alpha with the beta or they kept also the previous one. I'm guessing uh, they just replaced it. Yeah, they replaced it. I think they okay. they gave us a heads up in the last week call that this, the API has been stable and been used since quite a while. And they're just going to update alpha to beta, no changes in the fields. Yeah, but then I will expect here, for example, when you when you look at staging, right? API export v1 beta one. Uh, would should we have seen a deletion of v1 uh, alpha one? This is my question. 
let me take a look. I'm not even sure if it's we are supposed to do it, right? I'm not. It's like it's a uh, interesting question. I think you need to go to the source, right? Something like that. Yeah. Pardon, the, me. Pardon me. What What was the question? So the question you see here, uh, you can go on uh, to to the export folder. No, where you were. Uh, export. Like, yeah, here. Like if you put, if you see, see the export now, he uh, they added now v1 beta one, right? But they didn't remove the v1 alpha one, which is a good question. Is if it's like the question would be if you move from v1 alpha one to v2 alpha one or all kind of versions. No, sorry, v1 alpha one to v1 alpha two. Are you removing the alpha one? If you move to beta, are you removing the alpha? If you move from beta to G, do you remove the beta and so on? It's like what are the the rules here? Yeah. Um... For us, we don't have the rules, as far as I know. Uh, we don't, can you repeat? We don't have a rules, as far as I okay. know. Uh, for, uh, like, from Paul of, of uh, Kubernetes, I believe they, they keep them. Um, I actually don't know if they uh, remove them in the, like, later, um, but... I'm pretty sure that we need the alpha uh, on our side, at least. What do you mean on our side? Um, my employer, Red Hat. Um, so you, you, we need the, we need them because we need to the client to also talk with the previous version. This is why. Uh, so. You need the previous version because you can have a client which still talks only uh, in uh, in the alpha, right? But the thing is, you need to also have a conversion because if the beta is diverging, then the API needs to be able to convert it in, uh, to the old clients. Well, again, it's like it's 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 hard to have a rule only for the client and not having the same rule for the server and and see the whole picture like for you if there is a need to to have a ma matrix of scenarios that this needs to be supported and i guess someone needs to think about it in more detail because for example here if they didn't update the uh the server to support both, then this may be a problem. Um, I don't know. Like they have, yeah. It it will be odd. Like, can can a scenario like this even happen? Is is Covert the new version of Covert to use a Go client that is beta, and he it will try to use to to talk with a old version. Of a, of a CRD, which is in alpha, is this supported? We are supposed to support it even. It's, it's questions that we didn't answer them exactly. And no, no, I don't think so. Uh, so for so for the APIs which we had, for example, the VM, IVM, we we just kept them rolling with the with the V1, right? Uh, but uh, I think we never asked our, ourselves if we want to keep rolling other versions as well or other yeah. groups. Yeah. yeah, probably we'll need to have so, like a... So I think my understanding is that, so you, reading this part of the code, it says that the storage version is updated from V1 um alpha one to v1 beta one and i think what that means is that on the server side the storage version will be uh, updated but the v1 alpha one clients will still be able to read v1 beta one because because th this is present here if we don't have this present, that means that we are not registering the group version against the server. 
And if we are not resi registering the alpha one version against the server, that means that the clients will not be able to read. Yeah, so for it, it for me, it makes sense that uh, some old client, <clears throat> some old cli binary client that is deployed somewhere will be able to talk with uh, maybe it's I, actually, it makes sense. And at the same time, it doesn't make sense. Like a node client will be able to talk with uh, with a new server because that server also has uh, alpha there. I don't know how to read this actually, <laughs> but but yeah. maybe this is like, a, it sounds like its own topic here. Yeah, I think for simplicity, we can say that like fixed number of releases after the bump, we can start dropping, right? So we can say, um, we'll allow three releases, which is one year for people to catch up. And if they don't catch up by then, then that likely means that they will never catch up and we, we drop support. Um, yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm just not sure if you can, if that rule should work for alpha, betas, and GA the same. I, I mean, gen generally, generally, I guess it makes sense to to keep the alpha at least uh, if we don't know if uh, if it's going to be graduated or removed, right? Yeah, but alpha is like very. Alpha to me says it's like it's like it's really really the my first attempt here, and, and the risk for it to to break in with beta is very high. But so, I, but I don't know really. It's like we need probably we need to read how Kubernetes are looking at this uh, thing and how they be how they behave, and see based on their reasoning and logic which parts are relevant to covert and which we can simplify or harden i don't know and then then we'll know the, we'll know the rules i don't know if this in this uh, specific uh, bump to to better they even uh, did they just did it and that's the the outcome the default outcome and it, they they never thought about it or they actually it was thought about and that was the decision i don't know I think we just don't think about it, right? Rubo, that's more likely to happen. I don't remember us talking about it, but we can talk with Michael next week, I think. Okay. Okay, um, I have captured an action item here. Uh, e so are are you saying that we'll have to reach out to Michael for this? Uh, so uh, I think we will be in touch with him on Monday. So we are going to ask uh, and then we can follow up on Tuesday on the SIG API call. Okay. Yeah. Can I put yeah, you but I, th but I think you, we also need to have an action added on here that we need to learn about how this is working with what is the best practices that that are recommended when you move from alpha to beta from from beta to j in this sense or maybe when you move between version inside alpha and inside beta stuff like that like what is the what what should happen exactly that that makes sense to me because it's uh, still a work for us to maintain it so need to decide what, what to do it about it. So Ed, one question I had was, um, why can't we have a policy that is same for all APIs? The, for all API versions, I mean. It, you could have it, but for example, you do we agree that let's say that you have v1 and then someone upgrades the cd to v2 which is possible right so i think between v1 and v2 it's not the same rules as between alpha v1 and alpha v2 or between alpha v1 and beta v1 
I don't think it can be the same. It's like the alpha, no one is committed to the alpha one and to the beta one is, there is more commitment, but still. So I will say for alpha things, I don't, I'm not committed at all. It's like, it's take it on your own risk if you want to use it and think every time you upgrade, you may break, everything may break to, and be careful. Uh, for beta, but again, I'm not sure. It's like, maybe, maybe you still have to support it. I don't know. Yeah, I. so I think for me, and, and I think we can go look at the Kate's um, support policy, but for me, it we cannot say, okay, we are introducing an API in alpha and then start breaking them. Then we'll not ever allow people to experiment with it, right? Like, well, you can say, yeah, okay, we they should not experiment in production, but the the things that we are talking about here is code bases, right? Because people are going to vendor in the libraries. Now, whether they vendor in the library for production or for development environment, it's going to be the same code base that they vendor in. And then they'll have like a flag or something to determine whether this goes into development or this goes into production. So I think from that perspective, we should treat alpha beta in, in a very similar manner, but I, I'm just talking, I'm just throwing out my thoughts. I have not thought through it. So maybe we can take take a stab at thinking through it and then coming back to, to the discussion. Yeah, I will. I will prefer to to learn from the more from the experts in like in project like Kubernetes how they how they look at this and what their reason to do one thing or the other, and based on that we will know what makes sense or not. Because we can talk here about all kind of scenarios, but I can even think about a scenario that you have an old client, right, and that knows about uh, some uh, beta feature, beta CRD, right? But the server doesn't know about this uh, CRD at all because it's already deprecated. It went out. It, it didn't uh, went to graduation. So what will happen now? It's supposed to fail, as I, as I understand. But So I'm not sure what is supposed to happen exactly. If we need no, to I support... Think... The policy is that you'll, at least this policy I know, before removing an API, you need to have three releases of deprecation warnings. So that accounts for a year. So before that new client or before that older client will reach to, will get a surprise the server has to be updated to three more releases. Um, maybe, I don't know. I, I, yeah, maybe, yes. I'm not sure. I mean, I remember the when they did this uh, automatic the removal of beta, uh, they had like, uh, if, if beta is not uh, reaching graduation in three version or two versions, I don't remember what was the time period, then it's just removed automatically it's like that's the default unless someone gives you an exception so so maybe they took into account this uh, period or not i'm not really sure because but i i will i don't understand how they know that they are going to remove it in advance i don't think they are supposed to know about it they are they will remove it because it didn't reach graduation but again we need to learn about this more uh, to learn from the experts in order for us to be the experts. Yeah, this is the, why they created that time period.
Anyway, we can take it as an action item for that we should just do. Yeah, so, sorry, I was speaking on mute. But yeah, I think what I was saying is that uh, if you don't have an API graduating from beta, then in three release, it will be deprecated. It, this is not removing the API. This is deprecating the API. And then after three more deprecation warnings, it will be removed. So it will be staggered across six releases. Um, at at the third release point, they will know what will be deprecated, and the sixth release, they will know what will be removed. Where do you see the six? What did they say about another uh, three? That's so. That's in another document. Ah, okay. I'll have to find that for you. Okay, so if you'll find it, then it uh, it's interesting. I will. It will be interesting to read this. Sure. Yeah, I'll find that for you. Thanks. Okay. Um, it's funny, like every time you find something here, it opens up like a big, huge topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I hope that over time we will get better at this and we'll not have so many questions to research on. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. This was one of the PRs that came to my attention. Uh, what is happening here is we are changing the names from uh, essentially dropping the prefer suffix on one of the enum values in the API. And this is happening in a beta one API. Uh, but is it is it changing the actual name or is it just the name of the constant? I think like... both. Let's see here. Yeah, it's both. No, it's it, it is. What yeah. do you say? Ah, okay. They deprecated and uh, yes, they actually need to. They need to. They need to. Pre we we. This is another one that we need to learn from the deprecations and put it into writing, because for example, it is usually preferred to 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 change the name to deprecated in the prefix. So no one will, to make sure that no one will use it, like without changing the value. Like if prefer sockets is deprecated, then just write deprecated prefer sockets. But that will require, so anyone who updates the Kubernetes, sorry, KubeWord uh, APIs will have to make that change. Yes, this is like, Make sure that, uh, for example, if someone is is creating a new Go client or is using the Go client, stuff like that, they, you make sure that they will not use this one. First of all, it will make sure that they will see that they cannot use this one. But it's also uh, like uh, it's like saying this one is not it's not there. You you couldn't see this uh, done in in pods also like Kubernetes is was doing that all over the place. When they deprecate it, the only thing that they left as is is the name, uh, like the value, sorry. Uh, Ed, would you be able to find a reference to that? I think if we have a reference, we should put this on the PR and follow it. 
like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We need, in practice, the, the action item should be to, that's like the the medium long term is to define a procedure. But for this specific thing, I think the, the yes, we can we can just show that this is how they do it in uh, in the in po in pods, for example. This is what they did in the pod. So if you, if you look at the types of pods of a pod, then you will see it deprecated prefixed in several fields. Do you want me to open it? Um, if you want, it's like I can. Yeah, I can open it. Yeah. You just, just, yeah, if you, you can just write here, depre I don't know what's deprecated what. But yeah. Oh, yeah, I have gone through this many times. Now I know where things live. <laughs> You're an expert <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> just look for deprecated and that's it. I think you should find it. Uh, yeah, just go down or... I see that not not everyone here is the example of they where they did it. Yes, they had several places actually, but this is like a famous one. I think deprecated service account. I think I should look at the blame and then find the PR for it. I I looked at it. Uh, I think I, I tried to find it when uh, I learned about it, at least when I wrote that feature, uh, that feature life cycle thing. Okay, awesome. Yeah, but, uh, I think- it was a, But it was a detailed technical data. I didn't want to get into it in that document. It, it requires a different uh, best practices of what to do and why. Okay. Yeah, I think we should do this. I'm going to add three. But one, one, one reason that I can think of that they did it is, for example, that you want, uh, you still want to use the same name or a very similar name, and that so it will not be confusing. I think that's one of the re reasoning that makes sense. Yeah, like, for I, example, I think that's one thing. The other thing is that so. So here are the choices for you as a programmer, right? Like, let's say you are a consumer of KubeBot client libraries and you are forced upon this change deprecated. Yeah. So in terms of the APIs, the values don't change. So you're forced to change this. So now you, you can think that if I'm forced to change this value, why don't I just change it to this value? And that way you, you kind of twist people's hands people's hand to move forward in, in the right direction. I think that that was my interpretation. Yeah, but this is, by the way, the, the fact that you put a comment in the deprecated, for example, in some, uh, like in the Goland uh, ID, you will see it, uh, you will see like a, a dash uh, on the name. So you will know that you are not supposed to use it because it was marked with deprecated, but that's like if you use VI or Vim or something else, you will not see it. So if you want to make sure that it, every, anyone that uses any kind of IDE that is not specifically one that knows to interpret the comment also, then putting a prefix or deprecated, it's like it's a clear sign that you are using something wrong. So don't use it. That's it. I think this was was my reasoning that it made sense to me, and this is why I used it when I deprecated that past and mark it up and slip things. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, we got one review down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. See. So this one, um, Ed, if you can do me a favor and take a look at this. Yeah, yeah, I will. The next call. Sorry, right? it's like, 
Yeah, I'll go. I'll, I need to. I will put it in my priority. It will be hopefully this week. I'll get to it. Sure. Uh, I wanted to do it from the beginning of the week, but uh, it didn't work. We need to. We need to continue this. Uh, yeah. Next week. Yeah, we are coming up on time. I didn't realize. Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll take it forward next week. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.